On the line with us is the uh, journalist for The Atlantic and The New Yorker and The New York Times, the author of numerous books, his latest Last Best Hope, an essay on the revival of America, he, uh, theatlantic.com, you can find his writing, uh, or on Twitter, at uh, you can tweet him at, at The Atlantic. George Packer. Uh, George, this is a brilliant book, Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal. Um, I, your idea in the Equal America chapter of the smart and just versus the free and real, I want to get into, but I'd, I'd like to start first with your notion of the four Americas. Tell us, tell us about the four Americas that you're writing about here. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Um, well, after writing about the year 2020, this year of shocks and of defeat, I stepped back to find out how did we become so divided? And it's not just between red and blue, although that's an ob the obvious division, but red and blue themselves are divided. On one side, we have what I call free America. That's Reagan's America. That's you get the government out of the way. Uh, government isn't the solution, it's the problem. Cut my taxes, get rid of regulations, and set me free so that I can uh, make my own fate in life. This is and the Charles it, Koch the America, really. It's a libertarian America, right. exactly. And, and it promised widespread prosperity through trickle-down. It, ne it never happened. It failed. So free America was a powerful political uh, narrative that promised a lot and influenced us Im immensely, but that never delivered on its promises to a wide uh, number of Americans. It, it, it delivered for a very narrow slice of the country. Smart America is educated, professional America, the meritocrats, those who believe that the right schools, the right credentials, the right professions are the key to a good life and a successful life, and that parents can then pass on the, the, the advantages of being meritocrats to their children, who will then be, earn their own way into that blessed group. The problem with smart America, and I think of that as sort of Bill Clinton's America and really having its heyday in the 90s, smart America promised a meritocracy, but it really created an aristocracy. You're born a meritocrat. Your ticket is punched depending on who your parents are, where you grew up, what schools you go to, and who you know. And so it really isn't any longer merit that gets you to the promised land. It's birth. And that is the definition of aristocracy. So it has also failed. This, the third and fourth narratives are rebellions against the failures of the first two. On the red side is real America, a phrase Sarah Palin used in, two, in the 2008 campaign. That's the America of the white Christian heartland. It's nationalist, it's nativist, and it sees white Christians who work with their hands or who don't have college degrees as the true Americans and the, the educated elites, the coastal liberals, people live in cities, people who come from other countries, and in many cases, people who are not white are not real Americans. And so it has an exclusive um, cast to it and a, a resentful cast. The smart Americans are bitterly resented, I think, by real America. And finally, just America, which is a generational rebellion of young, mainly millennials, against the promises of their liberal parents who said, work hard and go to the right schools and do your homework and write that beautiful college application essay and your future is set. When, in fact, that began to seem like a hollow life and a false idea. And so the social justice movement of the last six, seven years, I date it to 2014 as the beginning of Just America, um, is a rebellion against a, the, the promise of incremental improvement of the more perfect union. Instead, it says we're a caste system. We have groups that oppress other groups, always have, probably always will. And the, the most we can do is continually fight against that in the name of justice. So that's also a rebellious narrative that has tried to break up the complacency of, of the earlier ones. So those are the four Americas that I lay out in Last Best Hope.
And, 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 and you do so brilliantly. Uh, I lived in Germany for a year. I have friends who live in Sweden. I, one of my very best friends lives in Israel. Uh, well, one in Israel and another in Australia. Actually, the one in Australia was the one I was thinking of, um, who I talk with on Skype you know, at least once a month. And those countries are all experiencing similar, uh, it's not a bifurcate, a quadra, quadra, there's, I don't know if there's a word for it, it's splitting into quarters. Yeah. Um, uh, very much so. I mean, you know, Australia may be even a little ahead of us on this uh, in some regards, uh, certainly a huge nativist, uh, you know, streak there and, 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 and racism is a big deal. It is growing in Sweden, it is growing in Germany and, and falling along these same four lines, is this just the, the, the fate of countries to, to, to kind of fall into these uh, divisions that seem to derive out of and in, re, and, re, and in reaction to essentially ethno-statism? Or is there, uh, is there something unique about the United States in this regard? Well, I've heard from people in those countries as well who've said you've described us. Um, I think the the bottom line, what unites all of these advanced democracies, is two forces that have been at work throughout my adult life. One is uh, an increasingly diverse, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-everything democracy. That's what the United States has become more and more over the last 40 or 50 years with open with immigrate the immigration laws changing in the 60s to include people from all over the world um, and with black uh, freedom in the civil rights movement with other oppressed groups uh, gaining their rights at the same time we have the end of the industrial age and the end of work that provided not just a good living but dignity and status even if you didn't have a college degree now we have an economy the information economy or the knowledge economy in which everything depends on having a college degree i think those two forces have destroyed a sense of shared citizenship that is always fragile in this country but that waxes and wanes and has set groups against each other in a competition for resources, for status, um, in a zero-sum game where there's winners and losers in all four narratives um, because of in inequality in a word is at the heart of the, the vitriol, the resentment, and the conflict that we see every day in, in America. And I think it's something like that is happening in, in other advanced democracies as well. With, without trying to uh, fall into the... Uh, all too facile trap of, uh, you know, well, you know, what's the easy solution here? Um, you know, the kind of salvationist ide <laughs> ideology. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what uh, broadly or specifically you would suggest we do about this with this knowledge. Well, Last Best Hope has a, a narrative that, that it proposes in place of these four. I call it equal America. And I use that word because equality uh, has been the kind of unifying passion of Americans. It isn't a reality, it never has been, but as a desire, as something Americans want for themselves. But to isn't be that as the point at which, at, at which the, the entire Republican Party and all the right wing billionaires who support them start screaming, you're talking about Karl Marx and socialism? <laughs> well, what do we mean by equality? I'm Quoting Tocqueville, the great French writer who saw America maybe more clearly. Yeah, maybe. And it still applies if you read Democracy in America. It's still true. He said the passion for equality is what distinguishes Americans from the Europeans of, of the aristocratic system. What he meant was not equal results. It was not a government big enough and, and intrusive enough to make sure every outcome was equal. And we've never had that in this country. And very few Americans have ever really push for that. But equal status as citizens, equal opportunities economically and socially, educationally, which really does mean radical change because opportunity is so unequal today, beginning with, with kindergarten and even before that, that it would take some radical s social policy to create truly equal opportunities or even to move in that direction and to 
um, to bring us closer to equal America. So uh, fascinating. Is it, are there any politicians or political parties that are? That are I mean, is this? Joe Biden, for example, is giving you know giving a talk promoting his infrastructure bill, and one of his sales pitches is you know not only does it build back America better, and not only does it make us more resilient with regard to climate change and you know et cetera, but that it's going to raise up a brand new middle class. It's going to bring you know all these good union jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Is that the sort of thing that I mean to, to get down to brass tacks here to get down to policy that you're talking about? We have about a minute left. Yeah, I think he's in the right direction. Biden, who isn't really a creature of any of my four narratives, he really is a throwback to the New Deal, to Roosevelt and Truman, which to me is closer to equal America than we are today. Biden, his policies, the way he thinks, the way he uh, believes in labor, in workers, and in the right of every American to have a decent life, yeah, there's something both simple and powerful about that idea, and I think it's at the heart of his domestic policy. I don't know if he can get there. I don't know if the best uh, legislation in the world could get us there, and I certainly know that the Republicans in Congress are going to fight like hell to prevent it. But I, I, it's to me, it's heartening that our president is now talking in a way that can really begin to make us equal Americans. The book is Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal by George Packer. A brilliant analysis and a hopeful prognosis uh, and, and you know, a future. Uh, George Packer. George, thanks so much for dropping by today.